After failing to win the 1886 New York City mayoral election, Theodore Roosevelt stepped back from public life to write. In 1894, he published The Winning of the West, a four-volume series about how the American race had come to dominate what he termed the West. Throughout the work, he heaps nothing but the highest praises on his ancestors. That is, until Roosevelt recounts the story of James Wilkinson, a general in both the American Revolution and the War of 1812. Of Wilkinson, Roosevelt only had this to say. In character, he can only be compared to Benedict Arnold, though he entirely lacked Arnold's ability and brilliant courage. He had no conscience and no scruples. He had not the slightest idea of the meaning of the word honor. He was treacherous to the Union while it was being formed and after it was formed. In all of our history, there is no more despicable character. Whoa! But what made him so despicable? And what drove him to be a traitor? That's what we will try and uncover today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Before we begin, we just want to get one thing out of the way. Today's story will be a long one. By telling Wilkinson's story, we're going to tell the tale of the Conway Cabal, an attempt in late 1777 and early 1778 to have George Washington replaced as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. It's a story of political intrigue, personal betrayal, and shifting loyalties. Looking at the story will not only help better explain Wilkinson's later espionage work for Spain, but will help us also dispel the myth of the United Founders. The man who would later draw the ire of the 26th President of the United States was born on March 24, 1757, to Joseph Wilkinson and Alethea Hage along the Hunting Creek in Calvert County, Maryland. Despite coming from a family that owned a 900-acre plantation and viewed themselves as members of the distinct order of gentlemen, by the time James was born, their wealth had greatly diminished, so much so that they were in debt. His father died when he was just six years old, and the estate, Stokely Manor, was broken up to settle the family's debts. In his memoirs, James the youngest of four children, would claim that his father's last words to him were, My son, if you ever put up with an insult, I will disinherit you. Whether these were indeed Joseph's last words to his son, or if they only served as a convenient explanation for James's reputation as a temperamental and passionate firebrand, we can only speculate. After Joseph's passing, Alethea's wealthy family supported the young widow and her four children. James, for example, was educated by a private tutor, David Hunter. An excellent student, James excelled at English literature, grammar, and the classics. By the time he was 16, James was sent to Philadelphia to study medicine. The city left an indelible impression on the teenager who had spent his life in the countryside. He was enraptured with city life. More specifically, he was enraptured with obtaining the acquaintance of the most accomplished and respectable of the fair sex whose ages correspond with his own. While attempting to find such a woman, and after briefly opening a medical practice in Monocracy, Maryland, the first shots of the American Revolution were fired at Lexington and Concord. Itching for adventure, Wilkinson immediately joined the Maryland Militia. After the Battle of Bunker Hill, however, he decided not to await the tardy proceedings of committees and conventions, and set out to Boston straight away to enlist in the Continental Army. Wilkinson, who had no military experience, was appointed a captain in the 2nd Continental Regiment. During the Siege of Boston, he served on the staff of General Nathaniel Greene, commanding artillery on Dorchester Heights. Shortly after the British abandoned Boston in March 1776, 
The ambitious 19-year-old captain was given his first personal command, an infantry company. He wasted no time marching his company to join Benedict Arnold's troops near Quebec. By the time he and his men finally arrived, Arnold had retreated to Montreal, where he was determined to hold General John Burgoyne. While preparing to hold Montreal, Wilkinson sent his former commander, General Green, a letter detailing the impending doom of Arnold's army. According to one of James's biographers, this letter, which was forwarded to Washington, marked the first time he had confused theater with truth, a mistake that would in time become a habit. After successfully retreating across the Canadian border with General Arnold, Captain Wilkinson was appointed an adjutant to General Horatio Gates. It was with Gates that Wilkinson had his first foray into political intrigue. In this arena, the vain, self-aggrandizing, and power-hungry Gates was a far better benefactor than Arnold. Promoted to major by the end of July 1777, Wilkinson was a valuable member of Gates's family. After narrowly avoiding being captured alongside General Charles Lee, Major Wilkinson guided his superior to Washington's camp on December 20th. With a fresh influx of 2,000 men, Washington planned his daring raid on Trenton. Gates, who thought the raid would fail, took this opportunity to maneuver himself as Washington's successor. He claimed he was ill and left to plead his case to Congress. Wilkinson was allowed to remain alongside Washington for the Battle of Trenton, his first taste of combat. He accompanied General St. Clair's brigade, which was anchoring the flank. During the ensuing battle, St. Clair forced a Hessian regiment to surrender as they attempted to break out of the encirclement. For his services, at Washington's personal request, Wilkinson was made a lieutenant colonel and given command of a new regiment. Before assuming command of his regiment, Wilkinson traveled through Maryland and Pennsylvania, attempting and failing to recruit more men for the Continental Army. He was far more successful, however, in getting a wife. While in Philadelphia, he began a lively correspondence with the young Nancy Biddle, eventually marrying her on November 12, 1778. The couple would go on to have four sons until Nancy died in 1807. Rather than assume command of a regiment, Wilkinson, with the permission of Washington, rejoined the staff of General Gates. In the lead-up to the Battles of Saratoga, after the loss of Fort Ticonderoga, Wilkinson came into his own as Gates' chief of staff, issuing orders in the latter's place, smoothing over relations with other officers, and both supporting and advising General Gates in all matters. Wilkinson recommended to Gates that Tadeusz Kajusko fortify a position to block Burgoyne's army. Gates reluctantly gave the order, and Kajusko fortified Bemis Heights. During the first day of battle, Wilkinson attempted to coordinate efforts between General Gates and his subordinates, namely Benedict Arnold, Daniel Morgan, and Henry Dearborn. Gates, ever hesitant, refused Arnold's repeated requests to launch a counterattack. His hesitation forced the outnumbered American light infantry to surrender the field to the British. Over the next few days, Arnold quarreled loudly with Gates. Arnold's flamboyant personality dominated the reserved Gates. It was Wilkinson who came to his rescue. Wilkinson convinced Gates that Arnold's actions amounted to insubordination, which meant Arnold should be stripped of his command. Gates being spurred on by his young protege, gave the order. Richard Varick, whose story we looked at earlier in this series, angrily commented that Wilkinson was at the bottom of the dispute between Gates and Arnold. When the battle resumed on October 7th, Arnold completely ignored Gates, Wilkinson, and everyone else who tried to stop him and personally commanded the battle before being severely wounded. As a testament to his services to General Gates, including stabbing Arnold in the back, Lieutenant Colonel Wilkinson was tapped to formalize the terms of surrender with the British. To say these negotiations were tense would be an understatement. 
the British forces, though severely weakened, were not finished. Hoping Clinton would arrive in time, Burgoyne attempted to delay the negotiations as much as possible. When the first deadline for surrender came and went, Gates was enraged and prepared to attack, correctly reasoning that the Continentals may well lose the next fight Wilkinson tempered Gates and convinced him to continue negotiations. While he successfully talked Gates out of a military offensive, he was busy launching an offensive of his own, a charm offensive. In face-to-face -face diplomacy, personal charisma goes a long way, and that was something the young, confident, handsome, and well-educated Wilkinson had in spades. As negotiations broke down on October 6th, Wilkinson leveraged his personal relationship with Colonel Nicholas Sutherland, one of the British negotiators, to prevent further bloodshed. Disregarding an order from Gates to break off negotiations, Wilkinson helped Sutherland convince Burgoyne to accept the terms of surrender at the last minute. The army would formally surrender the next day. After the formal surrender of Burgoyne and his army, Wilkinson collapsed from the strong excitements produced by the important scenes in which I had been engaged. The charismatic young subaltern suffered a nervous breakdown. After he sufficiently recovered, Wilkinson was sent by General Gates to personally report the Battle of Saratoga to the Continental Congress. While on his way to Congress, the 20-year-old colonel stopped by the headquarters of Major General Alexander Sterling. Long after the venerable general had passed out drunk, Wilkinson socialized with his two aides, the future president, James Monroe, and William McWilliams. The three men drank, Wilkinson more so than the others. In his drunken stupor, Wilkinson told the two men about a letter General Gates had received from Major General Thomas Conway. Conway, an Irish-born French officer who had been commissioned a Brigadier General in May 1777, wrote to General Gates after Saratoga that heaven has been determined to save your country or a weak general and bad counselors would have ruined it. Conway was a political ally of Gates and no friend of George Washington. Washington had opposed Conway's promotion to Major General. Intrigued by the drunk colonel's musings, Major McWilliams, when his own general had sufficiently sobered up, duly informed him of the conversation. Unaware he had aroused any suspicion, Wilkinson, once he sobered up, continued on his journey. After a brief two-day foray at the Biddle's residence, he arrived in York, where the Continental Congress was languishing after evacuating Philadelphia. Isolated, in cramped conditions, with the weather taking a sharp turn for the worse, Congress was unaware of what was happening around them. Their first reliable news was that Washington had been defeated at Germantown. Congress despaired. Most of them were convinced all was now lost. It was against this backdrop that the young Colonel Wilkinson strolled into York. He regaled the depressed, cold, and agitated members of Congress with the scale of the victory at Saratoga. Over 6,000 British and German forces were captured, along with 4,647 muskets, bayonets, cutlasses, 72,000 musket balls, and 42 cannons. Elated, Congress immediately sent letters to their emissaries in France and the Netherlands to gain support. The charismatic Wilkinson wooed Congress and, after some prodding by Gates, the War Board promoted Wilkinson to Brigadier General on November 6, 1777. At 20 years old, James Wilkinson became a general. But his star, which had ascended so rapidly, quickly came crashing down. The day he was promoted to Brigadier General, General Sterling, at his subordinate's request, sent Washington a report about Wilkinson's drunken comments. Washington inquired to Conway about the affair. The Irishman did little to mediate the situation. He escalated the matter by snubbing Washington in his reply. Conway also, for some reason, 
opted to send the president of Congress, Henry Lawrence, the original letter he had penned to Gates, as well as the letters to and from Washington. Gates searched for the culprit with a vengeance. Even Brigadier General Wilkinson was not immune from Gates's wrath. Rather than confess, however, he masterfully convinced Gates not only of his innocence, but also that another aide, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Troop, had leaked the letter. Gates bought the story, a true testament to Wilkinson's skill as a master manipulator. Feeling vindicated, General Gates wrote Washington, Those letters have been stealingly copied, but which of them, when, or by whom, is to me, as yet, an unfathomable secret. Gates then informed Washington that he would send the letters to Congress for help in rooting out the turncoat. Congress, as we know, was already aware because of the letters Lawrence had received from Conway directly. I'll quote Andrew Linkletter, one of Wilkinson's preeminent biographers, directly here about the impact this defiant letter would have on Gates's future career. Everything about this communication was calamitous for Gates. The plural letters told Washington, who had not realized it until then, that Conway had been in contact with Gates more than once. The demand for help in tracking down the perpetrator revealed that he did not know who was really responsible for leaking the weak general sentence, while Washington did. Worst of all, Gates's decision to involve Congress required Washington to do the same. I am under the disagreeable necessity of returning my answer through the very same channel, so making public the connection between Gates and Conway. Washington, likely with a smug sense of satisfaction here, replied to Gates he knew the information's source. It had openly come from Wilkinson. Washington ended his January 4th, 1788 letter as follows. I considered this as coming from yourself, and given with a friendly view to forewarn, and consequently forearm me, against a secret enemy or, in other words, a dangerous incendiary in which character, sooner or later, this country will know General Conway. But in this, as in other matters of late, I have found myself mistaken. Gates was stunned. He wrote back to Washington that Wilkinson passed on fabricated information to sow dissensions among the principal officers of the army and rendering them odious to each other by false suggestions and forgeries. Wilkinson, however, in a bid now to save himself, confirmed the authenticity of the letter to General Sterling, who, in turn, sent this confirmation to Washington. Gates was ruined, though he would continue to serve until his disastrous defeat at the Battle of Camden on August 16, 1780, he never threatened Washington politically again. When Colonel Troop wrote vindictively to Wilkinson about this affair, Wilkinson got the impression that Gates thought he purposefully leaked the information. Wilkinson's reaction was to challenge Gates to a contest of arms. At the last moment, though, the duel between generals was cancelled. With Gates out of the picture and Arnold recovering from his wounds, Wilkinson was without a patron. He immediately sought to ingratiate himself with the commander-in-chief he had so recently attempted to oust, going so far as to return to the rank of colonel voluntarily. But unable to win Washington's patronage, he resigned from the Continental Army on March 29, 1778. There would be much life left for James Wilkinson. He briefly returned to service in the Continental Army as clothier general of the army, but resigned in March 1781. His military career now at an end, Wilkinson, like many fortune seekers, crossed into recently pacified Kentucky in a bid to claim his fortune. Unfortunately, Wilkinson was not an adept businessman. He quickly ran out of money, squandering what little profit he did manage to make. By early 1787, he was broke. 
In May 1787, Wilkinson traveled to New Orleans to negotiate trade rights on the Mississippi River with Spanish Governor Esteban Rodriguez Miro. At least, that was the official reason for this trip. In August 1787, Wilkinson, who was promised generous financial support from Miro, signed a document that resulted in him transferring my allegiance from the United States to His Catholic Majesty. In November 1788, Wilkinson was at the center of a failed plot to have Kentucky declare independence from Virginia and join Spain. While these machinations would ultimately fail, Wilkinson continued to be on Spain's payroll. On November 7, 1791, after saying that he would bear true allegiance to the United States of America and to serve them honestly and faithfully, against all their enemies or opposers, whomever, Colonel Wilkinson was appointed commander of the 2nd American Regiment. Despite suspecting Wilkinson was a Spanish agent, Washington had Congress, in a move designed to soothe his ego, promote him to Brigadier General to serve under Anthony Wayne, the commander of the Legion of the United States. Throughout his time with the Legion, Wilkinson continually tried to undermine Wayne. At first, he did so from the shadows, writing letters to newspapers and politicians about Wayne's alleged incompetence. After he was outed to Wayne by Henry Knox, however, Wilkinson went public. The two men hated each other and made no attempt to hide it. Due to this personal feud, Wayne sought to investigate any potential ties between Wilkinson and the Spanish. When Spanish couriers were found carrying payment to Wilkinson, Wayne had all the proof he needed. Wilkinson had been relaying constant information to the Spanish. After settling affairs in the North, Wayne attempted to return to meet with Washington, but died of a stomach ulcer on December 14, 1796, before turning over his proof. Despite believing that Wilkinson was a traitor, he remained politically well-connected in the Senate. With his presidency ending and being a dead duck president, Washington was forced to appoint Wilkinson as senior officer of the United States Army, retroactive to December 15, 1796. And a traitor he was. In November 1796, he wrote to his Spanish handler to point out with precision the object to be pursued, and, if attainable, you shall find my activity and exertions equal to your most sanguine expectations. In 1798, as the quasi-war between France and the United States reached its bloody crescendo, Wilkinson was relieved of his post and ordered to prepare a reserve corps in the lower Ohio River Valley to quickly seize New Orleans in the event Spain and France officially went to war with the United States. By June 1800, James Wilkinson was once again the senior officer of the United States Army. He continued to pass information to the Spanish while serving as the first governor of the Louisiana Territory, including information that allowed them to attempt to kill the Lewis and Clark Expedition members. Nancy passed away while he was serving as the governor of Louisiana. James Wilkinson was also tangentially involved in the Burr Conspiracy when the then-Vice President Aaron Burr was accused of attempting to create an independent nation along the Mississippi River. Wilkinson tried to cover not only his complicity in the Burr Affair, but also the fact that he was a Spanish agent. After successfully manipulating events to ensure he remained undetected, he married Celestine Laveau Trudeau on March 5, 1810. The couple would later have twin girls. He also briefly served in the War of 1812, occupying the Spanish district of Mobile before, after suffering multiple defeats, was discharged from the U.S. Army on June 15, 1816. After the inglorious end of his inglorious military career, he served as the U.S. envoy to Mexico until his death on December 28, 1825, at the age of 68. He was buried in the Iglesia de San Miguel Arcángel in Mexico City. 
his involvement with the Spanish government, long suspected, would be conclusively proven in 1854 by the Louisiana historian Charles Gayaret. Wilkinson is undoubtedly a candidate for the most despicable character in American history, but his story, which we only briefly touched on here, his memoir is over 2,000 pages long, by the way, is a long, complicated tale that encapsulates the utter chaos, intrigue, and personal ambition that we often forget played a central role in the American Revolution. War is waged as much, if not more so, in the halls of power than on the battlefield. Wilkinson understood this very well and used his warm personality, good looks, and cunning intellect to manipulate both his allies and enemies alike. He was a spy for almost four decades. This alone should testify to his skill at the craft. In the end, he certainly was, as biographer Andrew Linklater claimed, an artist in treason. Thanks for sticking with us. We know today's video was a long one, but we hope it better contextualizes for you the messiness around the people and events of the American Revolution. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the Franconian-born nobleman who died at the Battle of Camden, Johann de Kalb.